All right, well, let's get started. <clears throat> okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tarek Massoud. I'm a professor at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and the faculty director of the Middle East Initiative here. And it's my tremendous pleasure and honor to welcome you today to the final event in our fall 2021 seminar series. Today's speaker, Stephen Biddle of Columbia University, will talk to us about his new book, Non-State Warfare, The Military Methods of Guerrillas, Warlords, and Militias. Now, 20 years ago, less than a month after the destruction of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, the attack on the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., the hijacking and crash of the United Airlines Flight 93, and the loss of almost 3,000 lives, the United States of America invaded the, uh, the uh, so-called Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan with the express aim of rooting out the terrorists who had planned and executed those atrocities. Now, a few weeks shy of 20 years later, U.S. troops beat a hasty and bloody exit from that country at the cost of more than 100 lives, including 13 U.S. service people, ceding control to the very militias that had dominated it before the U.S. set foot in the country. What went wrong? How did we so misread the Afghan situation? And most importantly, how did we prove so impotent in waging war on what looked in 2001 to be an assorted religious rabble? In short, why were we so bad at waging non-state warfare? And although Stephen Biddle's book is not about Afghanistan and the American debacle there, it surely contains answers to the question of why America's 20 year sojourn there ended in such catastrophe. Now, uh, Professor Biddle is Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He is one of our most gifted and sophisticated students of modern warfare. Uh, he has uh, served on a variety of government advisory panels and analytic teams, including the Defense Department's Defense Policy Board. He served on General David Petraeus's Joint Strategic Assessment Team in Baghdad in 2007, and he was a member of General Stanley McChrystal's Initial Strategic Assessment Team in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2009. Uh, before writing this book, he wrote uh, Military Power, Explaining Victory and Defeat in Modern Battle. And that book won a boatload of prizes, uh, including the Council on Foreign Relations uh, uh, Arthur Ross Award Silver Medal for 2005 and uh, 2005 Huntington Prize from uh, Harvard's Olin Institute for Strategic Studies, which was once based here at the Kennedy School. His articles have appeared in all of the best scholarly journals, including International Security, the Journal of Politics, International Studies Quarterly, and also in our most esteemed public outlets, such as Foreign Affairs, the New York Times, the New Republic, the National Interest. Now, in addition to being a creative and imaginative scholar of modern warfare, he is also intensely loyal to my employer. All, every degree he's ever earned has been from Harvard University, and I should note that his master's and his doctorate are from the corner of Harvard in which I sit, the Kennedy School of Government, which I think testifies to this scholar's uh, remarkable talent, taste, and discernment. So uh, Professor Biddle is going to give us an overview of his book for about uh, 25, 30 minutes, after which I'll ask him a few questions before turning things over to you, our audience. We anticipate releasing uh, Professor Biddle and you all back uh, to your holiday preparations at around uh, 2 p.m., although frequent participants in this seminar know that I am not the world's most faithful timekeeper. Um, with that, uh, please join me in thanking and welcoming Professor Stephen Biddle. Thanks, Professor. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I was clearly stuck in a rut uh, in higher education. Um, more, one of my advisors, actually, when I was a master's student at the Kennedy School, said, you know, Steve, uh, with three Harvard degrees coming, you will have your finger on the pulse of America. Uh, and I've tried ever since then uh, to keep my finger on the pulse of America. But uh, what I'm going to try to do today is to talk a little bit about non-state actors, uh, how they fight and why. With your permission, I thought I would share some slides since that's kind of de rigueur in the national security environment. There, we, oops, there we go. So uh, most wars in the world today uh, feature non-state actors on one or both sides. 
And one of the most common assumptions about those non-state actors is that they have a very distinct way of fighting that's very different from the way state militaries fight in interstate conflict. State militaries in interstate conflict are usually assumed uh, to feature uniformed combatants using massed firepower to try and destroy one another as a means of taking and holding ground. Uh, by contrast, non-state actors are typically expected to use irregular or asymmetric methods, things like uh, assassinations, car bombings, snipers, uh, roadside bombs to intermingle indistinguishably from civilian populations wearing civilian clothing uh, and to exploit new communications and mass internet media techniques to affect regional and world opinion rather than destroying opponents as a means of taking and holding ground. This very widely held assumption about how these two different classes of actors will fight uh, is widely thought to be profoundly important. The category error of mistaking a war against a non-state actor who's gonna fight in irregular ways, as if they were a state actor who's gonna use conventional military methods is widely held to have been largely responsible for American defeat in Vietnam, for American frustrations in the wars, uh, especially in Iraq, but also in Afghanistan an entire generation of US military modernization, weapon acquisition, training and doctrinal reform since 2001 has been oriented around shifting the United States military from a focus on this kind of ostensibly conventional interstate conflict to this kind of putatively asymmetric irregular war against non-state actors. But it's not just uh, the policy community, academics too uh, have been spending a great deal of time thinking about non-state warfare and civil conflict, there's been a flowering of academic attention to civil warfare since 2001. Uh, but the vast majority of that work has focused on the causes, the settlement and the termination of civil wars involving non-state actors rather than their military conduct. Uh, where the military conduct of these wars has been treated at all in the academic literature, it's typically with respect to the aspects of non-state warfare that are thought to be most distinctive and different from orthodox conventional state wars. Uh, whether or not non-state actors will target civilians, whether they will engage in atrocities, whether they use sexual violence. There have been a couple of interesting recent exceptions to this, Calavas and Ball Cells, uh, Lockyer, Stanford, uh, Stanton rather, but, but even those tend to accept these categories of irregular and conventional as the way everyone fights, even as they observe that some non-state actors occasionally use conventional methods. And the great majority of the academic literature you know, accepts the standard assumption that states use conventional methods, non-state actors use irregular methods. Um, so this distinction matters then both for scholars and for policymakers. If state and non-state actors actually fought about the same way, rather than in this kind of radically different method that most people expect, then radical military restructuring to deal with non-state actors would be ill-advised. And this huge academic literature on civil warfare would be about a distinction without a difference. All that said, this widespread assumption that there's a radical dichotomous difference and the way these two kinds of actors fight is overstated at best. Some non-state actors fight in ways that are relatively close to the kind of standard intuitive model, but lots of others do not. So to take a, an example of perhaps some interest to this group, Hezbollah, canonical non-state military actor in its 2000 war, 2006 wars again, war against Israelis in Southern Lebanon, use remarkably state-like conventional military methods. If, if I just described to you how Hezbollah fought in Southern Lebanon in 2006, and I didn't tell you it was Southern Lebanon, and I didn't tell you it was you know, Hezbollah or 2006, you would be forgiven for assuming that I was talking about the Eastern Front in World War II in 1943 or 1945 or 44. The distinctions are remarkably subtle. And it's not just Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda at Boivici, Highway 4, the Shaikot Valley in 2001 used methods that would ordinarily be considered very state-like and conventional. The Chechens in Grozny did in 1994, 1995, Rwandan rebels in 1994. So with, with all these exceptions apparently out there, just how different then are 
state and non-state military methods. Are they normally very, very different, but with these occasional unusual exceptions, are the exceptions becoming the norm? What should we expect for the future and why? What, what's, what explains the choices that any given non-state actor is going to use when they conduct military violence against an opponent? And what are the implications of that uh, for state policies for states like, for example, the United States? So those are the questions the book focuses on. You'll be relieved to hear that I'm not planning to go through the entirety of the book page by page in a dramatic reading. Um, what, what I thought I would do though, uh, is to sketch some of the central bottom lines that the book reaches, and then just outline very briefly some of the flavor of the causal argument that gets me to these bottom lines, and then say a little bit about uh, if you accept these claims, what difference does it make? Right? What, how should, if at all, should that change national security policy for actors like the United States? So the central claim in the book is that in fact, contrary to the standard expectation, there is nothing intrinsic to non-state status in the making of war. Some non-state actors already use methods that if you compared them with a variety of state actors, you would conclude that the non-state actor is fighting more apparently conventionally than those states do. In fact, when you look at the real military behavior, of real actors, not the kind of cartoon popular intuition that I sketched a minute ago, uh, but, but you look in detail at the way real actors use real military forces in real conflict, what you find is that both state and non-state actors' methods are so interpenetrated with the intuitive features of the other category that the categories themselves are remarkably unhelpful. Mostly what they do is they uh, cue us up and predispose us to reach false expectations for how anybody is going to use force, not just non-state actors, but especially. So this entire dichotomy in the popular mind and in the academic literature and in a lot of our policy decisions between conventional state warfare and non-state guerrilla asymmetric irregular warfare is essentially a false dichotomy. In fact, the better way to look at how any actor is going to use military force, but especially non-state actors, is to do it in terms of underlying incentives created by changing technology that give rise to requirements to stay alive on the modern battlefield. And that state and non-state actors are best treated as special cases of these general common dyna combat dynamics that affect anybody who's going to try to use armed violence on the battlefield in the 21st century, whatever their status. If we then say that these are not best treated as hermetically sealed dichotomous autonomous categories, but in fact, we look at military behavior as a continuum between empirically uncommon extremes that do correspond to the orthodox intuition, we find that almost nobody operates at the extremes. Almost all real military actors are somewhere in the middle of this kind of conceptual continuum. The modal styles of the special cases that are non-state actors and the special cases that are states are changing over time as a response to incentives created by changing military technology. And the nature of that change is tending to drive the modal military behavior of the most common kind of non-state actor and the most common kind of state actors towards the center to become more like one another. But as modal behavior is becoming more similar between these categories, variance around the mode is growing for them both. And the result is we're going to see an increasing amount of interpenetration in the future. We will see non-state actors whose methods are more conventional apparently than some states. We will see state actors whose methods are apparently more irregular than some non-state actors. Uh, and this set of claims, if you accept them, have some important implications for policy that I'll turn to uh, in a moment. Before I get to the policy argument, however, it's important to say a little bit about what's driving these changes. What, what's the causal argument that leads me to these kinds of findings? And the, the central point I want to make about causation here is that when you look at the things that are driving these phenomena, the salience of political factors is large and growing over time. Uh, material factors like changing technology are centrally important as well, of course, 
But also terribly important is the internal institutional makeup of the actor and the war aims or stakes that the sides are fighting over. A century or more of technological change has created an increasingly lethal battlefield for many, many generations now. Because of the technological change over a long, long period of time that's made the modern battlefield increasingly lethal, that has meant that anybody who wants to survive against what Ernst Jünger termed the modern storm of steel that is you know, post-1900 combat has had to increasingly adopt methods that we intuitively think of as guerrilla-like, right? Even state militaries have been forced to disperse. They've been forced to spread out, seek cover and concealment, become stealthy so as to get them out from under the increasing lethality of the modern battlefield. As state militaries have been forced to radically disperse, the, the orthodox combat density of military forces for a state military in the early 21st century is lower than that typical in the 19th century by a factor of a thousand as a result of the need to find cover and concealment to protect you from the increasing lethality of modern weaponry. As that has happened, the traditional ability of numerically preponderant state armies to mass at a point and simply crush numerically inferior non-state opponents has become less and less and less. As the requirement to find cover against increasingly lethal weapons has forced everybody to spread out and cause troop densities to go through the floor over time, this has set up a situation in which it is becoming possible in the, 21st, in the late 20th and early 21st century for even numerically inferior non-state militaries to contest the control of ground against even nominally much superior state forces that have lost progressively the ability to make their superior numbers tell because they can't concentrate to simply crush an opponent. This technological change therefore has created a potential. It's created an opportunity, a possibility for non-state actors to contest the control of ground, to protect sympathetic populations, to protect logistics caches, to have a, a survivable rear area. But for an actor to realize this potential involves a very, very demanding set of behavioral requirements. And in particular, we can go into more detail on this in Q&A if you like, but, but in particular, if you want to fight in ways that are remotely like what we think of as sort of conventional state-like military techniques, there is a tremendous premium on cooperation among interdependent specialist subunits. Modern conventional warfare, especially at these kinds of low combat densities, is extraordinarily complex. This extreme complexity poses some very important political requirements on those who would seek to fight this way on a 21st century battlefield. In principle, you can do it, but only if you can get the kind of trust and cooperation required for inter mutually interdependent specialists to be able to depend on each other and exploit the synergies that come from these kinds of interactions. And those requirements in turn imply that if your war aims are limited, if you don't think this is an existential fight to the finish, but you're fighting over divisible economic stakes, for example, it won't make sense to invest the kind of money and effort and opportunity cost in the training required to master military techniques that are this complex. So war aims matter independent of material. Secondly, how do you get trust and cooperation among a multi-thousand person military organization, even for a relatively modestly sized non-state actor? Um, well, in a huge range of social science domains, institutions have been shown to be critical facilitators of cooperation among specialists. Institutions in all sorts of different domains have been shown to be ways that to reduce incentives for free riding, increase cooperation, substitute iterated interactions for single transactions, extend the shadow of the future, enabling monitoring and enforcement of collaboration, create low cost resolutions of conflict. This operates in so many different domains of social science, we would expect it to operate in warfare as well. And therefore I argue in the book, that the maturity of the institutional development of the actor 
coupled with the degree to which they perceive the stakes in the war as being existential, is central in determining which non-state actors will be able to realize the potential the technology has handed them to actually operate in these ways that we normally associate with states. And in fact, non-state actors vary enormously on both of these dimensions, and especially their inst internal institutional makeup. As Zachary Mampelli and others have shown, in fact, non-state actors vary hugely in the degree to which they are institutionalized and internally organized to govern, kind of like states. So at one extreme, we have, for example, Hezbollah. Circa 2004, just before its 2006 conflict with the Israelis, in which we see a remarkably mature, remarkably formalized and Viberian institutional structure. Separate civil and military wings, separate military intelligence and operations branches, an operations branch that's subdivided into agencies for recruitment, combat action, indoctrination, among other functions. Hezbollah's institutional structure internally looks, although it's not a state, very state-like, contrast Hezbollah with actors like the Ulster Volunteer Force in Northern Ireland, Ireland or the RUF in Sierra Leone, where instead you have a small, centralized, personalized leadership cadre, very little division of labor or hierarchical suborganization, very little ability from the, by the plenary leadership to control wanton violence by subordinates, and as a result, serious distrust among multiple internal factions that sometimes fight with each other as much as they fight with opponents. In that kind of internal institutional environment, that kind of institutional setting, the UVF in Northern Ireland, the RUF in Sierra Leone, the RCD in the Congo, the Somali National Alliance in Somalia, in those kinds of settings, to assume that the others in the institution are going to do their job, and therefore it's safe for you to do your job as specialists, neither of whom can survive alone if they're gonna fight in orthodox conventional sorts of ways, would be extremely dangerous. Organizations like Hezbollah in 2006, organizations like Croatian separatists in the 1990s, organizations like Al-Qaeda in 2001, have the institutional infrastructure that enables this kind of cooperation, that it makes it possible for them to take advantage of the incentives that new technology has created for them. As technology changes, more and more non-state actors have this potential, but not all non-state actors are going to have this kind of institutional structure. And what that has done over time is to create some important time series changes in the way we can expect different kinds of actors to operate. So the, the book, uh, in one of its more delightfully pedantic passages, uh, defines the dependent variable, the outcome I seek to explain, the military behavior of the actor, along not using not a dichotomous you know, extreme uh, you know, auto autonomous characterization of conventional and irregular, but as a continuum between empirically unlikely but conceptually pure alternatives that to avoid confusion with the terms in the popular literature, I call Fabian and Napoleonic. Where the Fabian extremum named for one of its earlier uh, users, the Roman dictator uh, Fabius, uh, in the Punic Wars against Carthage is characterized by an absolute unwillingness to accept exposure or contest ground, dispersed operations with no local concentration in excess of the theater-wide density, exclusive reliance on coercive pain infliction rather than brute force seizure of objectives, an insistence on concealment by intermingling with the civilian population, rejection of heavy weapons even when they're available, as they often are, and an undifferentiated theater with no apparent front and rear. That extreme is contrasted with the Napoleonic endpoint, named not for one of its earliest users, but one of its latest, you know, Napoleon Bonaparte in the early 19th century, which is characterized by exposed formations relying on massed firepower that are going to dis defend ground by destroying enemies and control ground that will not be voluntarily relinquished, local concentrations to shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder densities 
at a point of attack where that ground is going to be contested. Exclusive reliance on brute force seizure of objectives rather than coercive pain infliction. Uniformed forces that fight on rural battlefields, the use of the heaviest weapons available to maximize firepower in a spatially differentiated theater with a clear front and a clear rear and all the combat activity going on at the clear front. And you're probably thinking to yourself as you listen to this and saying, that's ridiculous. Nobody fights either, either one of those ways. You're right. <laughs> These are you know, pure versions of the intuition we carry around in our heads, but they're lousy ways of waging warfare. If you really used purely Fabian methods, you have no ability to protect sympathetic civilians. You have no ability to protect your own logistics supplies. You have no ability to prevent the government from extracting taxes from the population. This is an extremely unpleasant way of waging war. As a result, almost no one ever does it. Similarly, the Napoleonic endpoint looks absurd. It looks suicidal. If you mass the shoulder to shoulder densities, you won't survive long enough to do anything militarily meaningful. And you're right. Therefore, no one does that either. Everyone is somewhere in the middle. And what the pedantic dependent variable characterization of the book does is it develops an index measure that will help you code the complicated intermingling of these characteristics that characterize real militaries to produce a location somewhere between these two endpoints where the interesting question is not, are you Napoleonic or are you Fabian? But how far away are you from these two conceptually pure but empirically uncommon uh, endpoints. If we look at theories change over time and how common these you know, particular points on the spectrum have been, I argue in the book that for state combatants in, say, the middle of the 20th century, before technological change had empowered non state actors uh, the way it has, what we saw was not purely Napoleonic warfare, that would have been suicidal, but relatively Napoleonic warfare by contrast with most non-state actors in the 1950s, where there was substantial variation in their institutional makeup, but the technology available for either combatant in the middle of the 20th century was not lethal enough to force numerically preponderant state militaries to spread out. Therefore, they could concentrate at a point and simply crush smaller non-state actors and chose to do so. This has changed over time as technology has changed. As the battlefield has become more lethal, state actors have been forced to fight more like guerrillas. They've been forced to spread out, disperse, seek cover and concealment to survive against the storm of steel. That's created an incentive for non-state actors who have the institutional makeup to do so, to move to the middle and not have to be unable to defend ground, to be able to protect sympathetic civilians, to be able to have logistic stocks that they can rely on, to be able to do all the other things that come with some ability to control ground. So over time, non-state actors have tended to move to the middle to exploit this opportunity where their institutional makeup enables it. Note the spread, the fatness of the tails on this 2020s non-state distribution that's created by institutional political variables. State actors, by contrast, have been forced in the other direction. If you then ask, what should you expect, if, let's say you're, you're the US military overall, right? What, what does the future threat environment look like? Well, if you just add those two curves up, it looks something like this, where the most common style of military opposition the US is likely to encounter is more Fabian than Napoleonic, but it's well to the middle of the spectrum and the tails are fat. There's a lot of variation out there because there's a lot of variation in institutional makeup out there. And that's a powerful determinant of how any given actor is gonna behave militarily. Now, if you buy all that, let me just say a word or two about what difference should it make then. So, I mean, there are a variety of policy issues that are related to this in one way or another. Let, let's just talk about one of the you know, more fundamental, which is what kind of military do you want to buy? What kind of opponent do you want to design the U.S. military to respond to? And that depends on a lot more than just what the threat environment looks like. It depends on how important different kinds of contingencies are and lots of other things. But let's just look at the marginal influence of expectations about who you're going to be fighting should be on the kind of military you should buy. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the same spectrum, opponents that are very Fabian to opponents that are very Napoleonic. And I'm now going to ask not how common are they at any given time, but what, how are you going to, to allocate US military capability across these kinds of opponents? And I would argue that the US military in, 20, in 2001, before the 
World Trade Center attacks looked something like this, that it was designed mostly to be most effective, highest capability against the kind of reasonably Napoleonic opponents that were typical of mid-century warfare. It had substantial residual capability against opponents that were absurdly exposed and massed and concentrated because there's, that's so vulnerable these days, but a lot less capability against very, very Fabian opponents uh, who didn't present good targets for the kind of military we owned in 2001. As some of you with my hair color may recall, uh, the big debate in national security circles circa 2001 was over the revolution in military affairs. And the argument there was that we needed a high-tech transformation that new technology, especially new information technology was revolutionizing warfare. And we should do away with all this old fashioned close combat ground force capability and cash it in for long range standoff precision strike. If we had actually done that, it would have created a distribution of capability over opposition types that I argue would look like the light blue line. It would be even more effective against extremely vulnerable exposed Napoleonic opponents than the Orthodox 2001 military. You could really make the rubble bounce, right? It's against opponents that were that vulnerable, but holy cow, if the opponent exploited covering concealment, dispersed, intermingled with civilian population, this kind of high tech standoff precision dominant military would have been radically less effective than the military it was replacing. That argument got a lot less fashionable circa 2005, 2006, as the insurgency in Iraq ginned up, when it was replaced with a low tech transformation argument. Again, the transformation advocates said we need to completely redesign the US military, but now what we don't want is long range standoff precision firepower speed. What we want is labor, not capital. We want a larger army and Marine Corps that will provide persistent population security and won't rapidly dart around the battlefield. We don't want standoff precision firepower because that just kills innocent civilians. That would create a radically different distribution of capability, much better against Fabian opponents than either the high tech transformation model or the 2001 legacy military but not very effective against those that operated around the middle of the spectrum because it didn't have enough firepower to deal with them. The US military then transformed itself. I would argue that by you know, 2011, much less 2021, the US military had essentially been transformed to be a counterinsurgency force. It wasn't as transformed as the transformation is wanted. So the military was subject to a lot of criticism for not going far enough, but it had gone a lot. And its effectiveness against more Napoleonic opponents, while greater than what transformationistas wanted, was still pretty limited. What should you do if you buy the argument about the threat distribution that I suggested a moment ago? Well, perhaps something that looks more like this, where you're maximizing your capability against what's probably the most common style of future opponent that will produce substantial residual capability against people who are more exposed and therefore more vulnerable. And it will produce you know, more dismounted persistent infantry strength than either the 2001 military or the high-tech transformation military. And thus it has better residual capability as more Fabian opponents. But in an important sense, it's kind of a back to the future sort of argument. This military, if you were to look at it in detail, and we can talk more about its makeup if you want in Q and A, would look more similar to this than to anything else on the slide. This would not be a military that looks so radically different from anything you've seen in the past that you would say this is transformational. If you buy the causal claim in the, that I advance in the book and you accept the expectations that it implies for what kinds of threats you'll see in the future, the implications for the US military is not, are not as transformational as either of the popular transformation arguments that have shaped much of the defense debate over the last uh, generation. With that, why don't I uh, stop uh, and uh, we can go to Q&A. Great, thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Biddle. So let, let, me, um, let, let me try to start us off by asking just a few um, questions. I mean, I, I, I'm very much taken by your argument. I think it's, you know, clearly true 
that um, you know these ideal types don't really correspond to any uh, military in the world, and I, I've you know what you've forgotten about military behavior, I have not yet learned, and so um, you know, but it is surprising to me that anybody actually ever thought the, that these ideal types were anything other than ideal types. Um, but what I'm having a hard time understanding is the mid-spectrum strategy that you describe, because I can't quite figure out if you're telling me it's rare because it's hard to do or that it's very common. You know, on the one hand, you're telling me it's hard to do, but on the other hand, you say on page, I can't remember what page it is, I think page two, you say almost all real warfare for at least a century has been closer to the middle. So then is this about... Um, being in the middle or is it about doing the middle well? I'm just trying to figure figure that out. Well, it's, it's an awkward question to answer because middle is another category. So a, a big part of the argument I'm trying to make is although lots of us use categories because they're easy to, to use, right? They're easy mm -hmm. to talk about, they're easy to name. There's a reason why a lot of social science is denominated in categorical terms. I, I argue that in this case, especially, right, in lots of real world situations in the social sciences, but especially in this one, it's, it's, it, it's a way of thinking that, that tends to shape our analysis in unhelpful sorts of ways. So you could, if you wanted to chop this thing up mm. into categories, you, you can call this the middle. Got it. Or you can call this the middle and right. what it is is it's all essentially arbitrary because these are all smooth curves i hear you it's a continuous variable how yeah. how but how well are you able to measure that continuous variable uh well uh there is an appendix in the book that lays out a coding scheme uh that i submit you know those who read the appendix <laughs> Um, which I, I have no evidence that any actual human has yet done in either of this or military power. Actually, you, you put these appendices there because uh, they, they take up space and they increase the cost of the book and publishers therefore make more money. It, 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 but I've, I've, I have no evidence that people read appendices. If you were to read the appendix, uh, mm -hmm. there would be a, a, a coding scheme there that I submit is sufficient if you have sufficient information access to code any military. Um, yeah, I code the five in the case studies numerically, and the case studies present numeric codings on this scale. I code a variety of others. The, the, the challenge here is because I'm talking about variations in military behavior that have rarely been talked about extensively in the literature. The, the historians like we, you know, policy analyst folk, have a certain tendency to get their thinking grooved by the categories they use. Mm -hmm. So historians who talk about gorillas tend to talk about you know, standard gorilla kinds of behaviors. If, if you want to code this spectrum, you need much more granular behavior about the tactics and operations used by real militaries than most secondary histories provide. The, the case studies in the book, with the exception of the, the Vietnam case, were all driven by field work where I spoke to either combatants or people who had seen the combatants with their own eyes and could characterize military behaviors like what was the duration of firefights? What was the range at which fire opened? Were they or were they not using suppressive fire to cover maneuver? Uh, you know, the, the kind, this, this kind of granularity of detail is necessary to do the coding in the appendix. It's all, in principle, it's always available if you can get interview access to people who saw it, mm -hmm. which these days you can, right? One of the, it, this is in many ways the golden age for field work and national security. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of warfare lately. Fortunately for scholars, that means there's a lot of evidence lately. So the, the, it, it's possible to get this kind of information, but it requires a, a substantial granularity of detail. Mm. If you do that, then you can code people on this spectrum using that coding scheme, which mm -hmm. is designed specifically to enable it, but it requires a, a substantial amount of information that, that's yeah. inescapable, I think, in this setting. I, I think in, in, in the Q&A, we might even get, in, get into some of that data because it is an, a very impressive evidentiary base. So the, the last question I'm going to ask before opening it up is, so you've talked about this error that 
people tend to make where they want to fit behavior into these discrete categories. And it's very clear to me that scholars would fall prey to this behavior because, as you said, that's kind of what we always do. But it sounded also like in the book you were saying military leaders fall prey to this uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why. So let's imagine I'm the American, you know, I'm a general in the U.S. Army, and I'm having to do the thing that you described, right? I'm having to fight war. Consequently, I'm having to kind of optimize and figure out where along the spectrum I'm going to place myself. Why on earth would I not think that my opponents are doing the same thing? I mean, there's a substantial amount of cognitive dissonance in my experience in the way a lot of soldiers and officers approach this. So let me give you an example from the Israel Defense Force. So one of the cases in the book, of course, is Hezbollah in 2006. To develop the evidence for the case, I had to you know, travel to Israel and interview people who'd fought against Hezbollah and could tell me these kind, this kind of granular detail in how Hezbollah was operating. And the, the price of my access to these officers is that the Dotto Center, the IDF Center Disciplinary Center for the Study of Military Affairs, um, took as its pound of flesh uh, that I would brief them on the uh, research design before the work started and on the findings when the work ended. So I, I showed up at the Dotto Center to present this brief. And the overwhelming opinion in the room, especially in the research design uh, talk was, why are you bothering? Hezbollah is a terrorist organization and, and guerrillas, and we already know this. Okay, fine. Let's, let's see where the facts take us. So I collected mm -hmm. the evidence, came back the second time, presented the briefing, and, they, and the, the overwhelming view in the room was, no, you're wrong. They're terrorists and they're guerrillas. I said, well, like, here's all the specific case evidence, right? So here's evidence from your own officers who told me that Hezbollah fought for 12 hours over ground at Avivim Junction, for 10 to 12 hours contesting ground at Maroon Aras, for seven to eight hours at Ronderia. That at Avivim Junction, you had to clear a dug in defensive position by direct assault, and all 20 Hezbollah fighters were killed. I just went by point by point by point through what I found in the interviews. But strong view in the room, right, is we, yeah. we know what Hezbollah is. Now, yeah. I mean, it, it's some level of these things, right? I mean, some of them were the people I was interviewing, right? The right. battalion commanders in some cases, but, but the categories that, that shaped the way they thought about this were in tension with the granular details of what they were actually encountering on the ground in the fight. Now, over time, you know, natural selection works in a, in a domain that's as harsh as warfare, right? So it, eventually, Behavior conforms to the incentives created by reality, but but you know, officers are humans like the rest of us, and the way they think is shaped by the categories that they use, and the adaptation process, I would argue, is slower and less efficient than it should be mm. when those categories are un unhelpful. Yeah. I think if we want adaptation to be faster and at a lower price in lives and treasure, then understanding cause and effect using categories that are helpful and not unhelpful that, that facilitate proper understanding and faster adaptation rather than hindering it is useful and worthwhile. I'm all, all for using categories that are helpful. I mean, <laughs> the, the issue is, you know, these are people who have serious skin in the game. Sure. And so, um, you know, the, the fact that they're not properly comprehending the their opponents is kind of uh kind of really puzzling um um the, the, i guess the last thing i want to ask and then i will open it up i promise and i see uh, professor david patel has his hand up is just you know so much hinges on this variable institutionalization mm -hmm. you know how weberian is the actor where does mm -hmm. that come from in your view Meaning, how do I code it or what? No, like it? where does what determines whether a non state actor or even a state actor for that matter is going to be a uh, Weberian or not? Uh, well, here I'm going to, to hide behind pedantry and, and argue that for the theory in the book, institutional maturity is an exogenous independent variable, right? I don't seek to explain it, I just take it as given and then ask if you observe this institutional makeup. 
what kind of military behavior should you expect, but I don't seek to explain why institutions take the form that they do. I would have yep. liked to have done that and experimented some. The, the, the trouble is my reading of the political development literature mm. is that it was not sufficient as of today to enable a strong causal claim. I, I could have, mm. and, and the trouble is if it isn't a strong causal claim, then it's one whose validity I must establish. Mm. And a, I'm a military affairs functionalist. I'm not a political development scholar per se. Um, I use their findings, but uh, they're better at advancing the frontier yeah. of knowledge in their field than I will be. Yeah. If, if there isn't a well-established a causal theory to explain institutional you know, maturity, yeah. then I'm responsible if I use it. And, and yeah. you, that would have been at least two books rather than one. Yeah. So instead, I argue that there's little reason to expect endogeneity problems here for reasons we can talk about if, if the methodological issues are of interest. Yeah. Uh, and given that, I'm simply going to take it as an unexplained yeah. independent variable. Yeah as a causal agent, not as something that I'm going to explain the cause of. Yeah. I mean, I guess you, the, the, I guess the argument is, and again, you know, uh, stipulating that you've forgotten more than I'll ever know about this is that you could imagine that uh, the level of institutionalization of a fighting force would be endogenous to the, something about the nature of the conflict because there, that creates an evolution, you know, more existential conflicts. I, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to think about what about the conflict would create these pressures towards, um, you know, developing better institutional, internal institutional structures, but it's not a hard jump to that kind of conclusion. Um, well, and one school of thought in political development is along those lines, right? The, the standard Tillian view of state formation. Exactly. Is that, you know, the state made war and war made the state, right? Exactly. Incentive, survival incentives that gave rise to, in a sense, the institutional maturity that is the design of the modern yeah. state. The trouble is that's not uniformly accepted within the political development community. Um, if that were an established orthodoxy, Yep. then I could simplify the independent variable structure of the theory down to stakes. Yep. Right. Because institutions would be endogenous to stakes. Yep. And I mean, and, and if, if you buy that, if, if you think that the, uh, the, the, the counter arguments to the Tillian view are trivial and unimportant and boring, and we're not going to credit them, uh, then you could safely accuse uh, the, the book of being longer than it ought to be. Uh, and less parsimonious than it should be. Yeah. Because I've got one independent variable that I don't need. I, I wasn't willing to go there. Yeah. Um, in, in part because I, I didn't think the political development literature was ready to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think if you took that view, the result would be the slide I'm got on the screen at the moment or the policy implications that I sketched earlier would be unsound. Yeah. What you would have is a cleaner causal argument as to how you get there. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't willing to be that clean and, okay. and parsimonious. And therefore, I drag people through hundreds and hundreds of pages of tedious text. Uh, not, not tedious at all. Very, very illuminating. OK, uh, we're going to have a, a, an insurgency if I don't open it up to uh, the audience. So I see uh, Professor David Patel and then uh, Avner Halpern. So go ahead, David. I will ask you to unmute. Would, would it be a Fabian insurgency or Napoleonic? That, that's the key. <laughs> so then, thank you. This is this is fascinating. I mean, I, I, just an aside to a question that Tark asked about the experts getting it right. It's notable that that basically the ceasefire that emerged from the Israel uh, Hezbollah war in 2016, on uh, 2006, 15 years later, is still there, right? So they they both seem to. Anyways, my you, you focused a lot on that movement from S1 to S2 and almost described it as a, in a game theoretic way, like a best response. But I'm, I'm really more interested in that move from non-state actor one position and non-state actor two position. And I, I felt like you, you kind of punted a little bit by saying you're not going to endogenize institutional, institutional structure or change. But there's all sorts of ways a population could go from NS1 to NS2, right? Uh, one could just be a survival mechanism. Maybe there are just a whole lot of things in 1950 and only the ones that evolved or the ones that looked a certain way survived till the 2020s. Or maybe the technology, maybe it's a technological constraint. 
right? It's a lot easier to organize this sort of internal command and control and supervision. You emphasize the importance of specialists and violence within an organization, trusting that other specialists and different forms of violence within the same organization will do their jobs when called upon. That's much easier in 2020 than it probably was in 1950 with cell phone technologies, with different ways of command and control and monitoring, higher education levels, presumably, of who's being recruited into these organizations. So it just seems like your argument depends your argument, not to, but your argument is that that movement from NS1 to NS2 is a function of increasing lethality on the modern battlefield. And I, there's, there's all sorts of other ways you could go from one to two that would then justify the policy prescription to move from S1 to S2. So again, I'm not asking you to completely understand the problem of causal identification of why organizations look the way they do, but that seems to be a really important thing to convince me of if I want to buy the overall argument. Okay, well, let me take a crack at convincing you then. Uh, so the argument has often been made that new information technology is going to make the management of complex operations easier over time. Th these days, the, the fashionable way to make that case is AI. A common argument that uh, AI will uh, allow even very complicated military operations to be managed very straightforwardly. Um, my sense is that uh, that argument has has performed very poorly empirically. That what's actually happened is that as technology has changed, um, the increased complexity of the equipment has swamped the ability of information technology to facilitate communications. And if anything, the ability of information technology to facilitate communications has made the problem worse rather than better. So a, a classic example would be, um, I was uh, either lucky enough or unlucky enough, depending on your, your taste, to be in uh, the headquarters cell in uh, CJTF Mountain in Afghanistan in 2002, just a week or two after Operation Anaconda. And I was there to interview people who had fought against Al Qaeda in, in 2002 in the Shia Kot Valley. And there were these, I was in the, the you know, division level command post, a pretty senior organization, right? The most senior military officer then on the ground in the country. This was his headquarters. And there were big screens all over the talk. And on those screens were images of goat herds walking around the Shai Coat Valley. And I asked, what am I looking at here? And it was a drone feed. It was a series of drone feeds. And what was happening is that everybody in the division headquarters was staring at this drone feed. Now, there were like 98 command echelons between you know, two-star General Buster Hagenbeck and local units that should have been worrying about what was going on in some 10 square kilometers of the Shai Coat Valley in Afghanistan. And yet everybody in that headquarters was staring at that drone feed. And what that meant was that there were you know, 98 layers of command that were all bearing down on this one poor schmo at the tactical level, who was responsible for what was supposed to be going on in that area. And they were all piling on telling him what to do because they could. Right. In 1950, this just wouldn't have been possible. You, you know, local commanders had autonomy because it was impossible for two star generals to order second lieutenants around the battlefield. Now they can do it and they want to. <laughs> And what that does is massively increase the amount of message traffic that's flying around and massively increase the amount of opportunities for people to overrule one another and massively increase the amount of information that everybody in the system is supposed to be in command of. So I mean, th this is a standard argument in the sociology of information technology, actually. I'm not making any unique or novel argument in, in military affairs. That there's a widespread argument among, social, among sociologists who study information technology that in fact, the increasing ubiquity of information and the increasing speed of communication has actually you know, made the problem of coordination harder and not easier. And certainly I think that's been the case in the military domain. So I don't think it's been the case that the, the complexity of managing this very complicated military enterprise in the environment between NS2 and S2 has, has become easier for non-state actors because now they have cell phones. Um, you know, I, I just think the, the nature of, the, the complexity of what they're doing and the way information flows work in real organizations 
uh, if anything, have made that problem harder, not easier. Um, so you also uh, talked about the possibility that there are just more Hezbollah-like institutional organizations among non-state actors now than there were then. Uh, one of the reasons why the Viet Cong are a case study in the book is because the Viet Cong uh, occupy an earlier technological moment uh, before the dawn of modern precision weapons. In fact, they were arguably the last non-state actor to exist before the dawn of modern precision weapons. And the Viet Cong are in many ways the most institutionally mature actor I studied. Certainly, at least as hierarchically organized, at least as uh, independent of factional dispute, at least as responsive to plenary orders, all of you, you, you tick through all the things that, that are responsible for institutional coding in the system that I use in the book. And the Viet Cong would emerge as at least as mature as any other actor and probably more so. And they were operating in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, now, a rigorous claim about uh, the distribution and changes in the distribution over time and the political makeup of actors would require a data set that we don't have. Uh, but uh, certainly I am aware of too many examples of well-institutionalized actors early in the time period of interest and very poorly institutionalized actors at the end of the time period of interest to be willing to conclude that there's been a systemic, systematic change over time in their prevalence. Got it. Okay, let's, um, we're, we're up on two o'clock, but I want to at least get one more question in because this is just fascinating. So uh, Avner Halpern, go ahead, sir, and I will unmute you. Hi, um, thanks for the illuminating talk. Uh, quick question then. Now, I've, I'm an Israeli and probably was in, the, in rooms with people like the ones you described when you presented your outcomes. And when I try to get into their heads and try to understand why they responded the way they did is probably because the standard analysis is that, you know, if you're a terrorist organization, that's bad. If you're a state-like organization, that's good. Yeah. And so they would not want to re recognize this as a more state-like or organized. Uh, so my question is really, is that judgmental kind of, uh, uh, view still relevant and at what point and you know new and stronger weapons coming in maybe even unconventional weapons would that change that as well I, I think you make a very interesting point here that there's a strong pejorative loading to especially terms like terrorists but also terms like irregular and guerrilla and insurgent and and all of that and i think part of the the ex, part of the answer to Tarek's question about how can militaries get this wrong uh, is that if anything, I think militaries tend to be even more inclined to see this in normative terms than the rest of us would. Um, and, and that has, has all these kinds of powerful shaping effects. I'll, I'll tell another war story, right? Civilians, it, it, when civilians get the occasional chance to tell war stories, we, uh, we should all jump at it. So um, I was, uh, in Iraq in 2003, uh, among other occasions, um, and I was talking with some American officers uh, who were involved with uh, detention operations way back in 2003, very beginning, where the people in detention were the uniformed Iraqi soldiers that had surrendered during the upcountry march. And I was there with a research team that was half military and half civilian, and the, the basic attitude of the civilians here was, we should be treating these people as well as we possibly can because this is the future Iraq here, right? These, these are the trained elites in these camps and we should be you know, showering them with rose petals, right? These are the people who did what we asked. They surrendered when we asked them to surrender. They're not melting into the woodwork and becoming insurgents. Uh, and the, a lot of the officers we were working with would have none of it. They were furious at these people. These blank, 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 were shooting at our people until yesterday. And, you know, and they were furious. And, you know, this is what Clausewitz leads us to expect, right? Clausewitz, you know, 
famous 19th century Prussian military philosopher says that you know, war is an activity that engages the emotions and engages the passions. And when, when you add to the expectation that this enemy is going to be shooting at my people, killing my soldiers, and maybe they mean to kill me personally, and it's easy to refer to them as terrorists or you know, guerrillas or other things that imply a lesser sort of activity than we state uniformed professionals do. I, I think there's a strong tendency to allow lots of other observations to get shaped and colored and conditioned by these kinds of expectations and these kinds of normative preferences and labels. Um, now, again, one of the advantages of theory, right? If we're going to be social scientists, my, my own view is that over time, subject to selection pressure that is modern warfare, military organizations adapt faster than most of us think they do. I, mean, I, I tend to, to be on the, the side of the organizational debate that says militaries are not reactionary, head in the sand, unchanging battleship admirals and cavalry generals. But they don't adapt as fast as they might. And our job as social science theorists is to help them adapt faster and ideally better, in part because our, we, we have theories that need not have this kind of overhang to them, that need not have this kind of pejorative loading, that need not have this kind of grooved thinking in which the assumption is that all bad things go together. Right? As social science theorists, we have the ability to take this kind of cold, dispassionate, bloodless detached look at all of this. And that's our role. Uh, yeah. I mean, no, I don't have the ability to give orders to anybody. And if I did, no one would follow them. If, if people like us have anything to contribute, that's what it is. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. And I think there's um, a whole discussion to be had about the, the role of social scientists and the utility of social scientists in this kind of um, uh, uh, inquiry. Um, I think uh, it's it's just fascinating, uh, fascinating set of questions that you've put on the table. Okay, we are at time. So I have to thank you, Professor Biddle, for writing this book, uh, which is really a model of uh, social science that seeks to engage a very important question in the real world. I wanna thank you for coming here and sharing it and engaging with our audience. And I wanna thank our audience uh, for being with us uh, today and throughout this semester. Um, this is, as I mentioned, when we began our last event of the semester. So we'll see you all uh, next semester, end of January. And in the meantime, please visit our website, hks.harvard.edu slash Middle East to stay up to date on what we're planning. Until then, I wish you happy holidays. And once again, Professor Stephen Biddle of Columbia University, author of Non-State Warfare, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye, everybody.